with that, I am going to go and get started. I got Amy Mendez that just showed up too. That's awesome. Uh, for those of you who are first time bridge clubbers, I'm so excited that you are here. It is critically important you have a beverage. We do use these. It can be water. We don't ask. We don't ask people what's in their beverages um, unless you want to brag. And then that is quite all right um, as we do it. So this is our opportunity to bring everyone together. So I do want you to get your glass, uh, get ready to raise your glass here in a moment because we will start with the toast because that's what we do. But it is my um, great honor that we're bringing this topic forward. Uh, because uh, Cindy Trice and I met um, at Vet Partners and we started talking about relief vets. We started talking about what it means and we've not covered this topic ever on the Bridge Club. So I am so geeked up. How does the Bridge Club work? She's gonna talk a little, she's gonna ask you guys questions. Raise your hand, jump in. This is a conversation. PowerPoints are banned at the Bridge Club, right? Banned. This is a conversation, so we want people to jump in. So if you're muted now, feel free to unmute yourself unless you have what will happen to me shortly. Hey, Amy, it's nice to see your face. Um, uh, my dog will bark soon, and I have to I may have to mute myself, but that's just life. Um, so I'm so excited. So Cindy is the founder of uh, Relief Rover. Very, very excited she is here. So Cindy, I'm gonna turn this over to you, and we'll get started with a fantabulous toast. Hey, Warren, nice to see your face. <laughs> Hi everyone. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you my friends out there. Um, and I would like to make a toast to all of the adventurers, the wanderers, those people who love change. Brenda, your change is going to be great coming up. <laughs> and, um, and this is, you know, nerdy, but I do like that. I've always loved the Tolkien saying, um, not all those who wander are lost. Oh, so, love it. Here's all right. Your, cheers, everybody. Cheers. Very important we toast. I just realized my glass looks like it's as big as my head. <laughs> <laughs> it does. That's started. awesome. That's either a good thing or a really bad thing. I'm not sure which. <laughs> all right. See, lots of new faces. This is fantastic. Anyone who, uh, Kate, if you can turn on your camera, please do. People will be joining as we go through this. But Take it away, my friend, dear Cindy. Okay. So, well, first, I want to ask how many people are relief vets now? And I don't, okay. Um, I, can you gosh. count them? I've got two. Is there any more than two? Three. three. One, two, three. Uh, yeah. two, okay, four. Okay, I think we got two or four. Awesome sure. sauce. Thanks, sure guys. She is, but we're going to pretend that she is and say that we have four. Okay. Yeah. And then how many people are not a relief vet, but interested in being a relief veterinarian. Oh, okay, good too. Awesome. Two. Okay. And um, what are the rest of you people doing here? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get to drink wine in the, you know, people we think are really cool, so. Hey, yeah, maybe it sounded really interesting. Yeah. Um, no, I'm happy everyone's here. I just kind of wanted to get an idea of, of who's who. So um, for those people who are thinking about being a relief veterinarian, um, those of you who are relief veterinarians already know this, um, but there are a lot of benefits being a relief veterinarian. And you know, some of them are obvious, flexibility, flexibility in your schedule. Um, you can sort of curate a, a lifestyle that you want, that works with your budget, that works with your family, that works with your hobbies, that works with your friends. And um, I have spent the majority, I'm a 2004 UC Davis grad, but I've spent the majority of my time as a relief vet, although I did spend some years as an associate, and one of my associate mates is on here, Warren, um, and, and I actually, I loved being an, an associate as well. But what I found is that for me, uh, having that flexibility in my life and the ability to travel when I wanted to travel and um, to, I kind of like to be a binge worker, work really hard, save up some, squirrel away some money and then um, take off and sort of take care of some other sides of my life. So it, it can be a really good career for things like that. The other thing I love about being a relief vet is it's really given me this appreciation of our profession in a different way than I had before, because I see so many different practices. I've worked at 
probably about 50 clinics in four states and anything from rural one doctor practices to doing emergency work at specialty centers and everything in between. And it has just given me, I love this profession even more because I've just seen so many different ways of doing things and I've met so many different colleagues and now doing Relief Rover has sort of brought it to that next level and I've gotten to meet all these great people. Um, so, and the other thing I love about being a relief vet is no matter where I go, <laughs> it's, I'm appreciated. Clinics really appreciate having someone come in to help them out so they can take a vacation, maternity leave, um, or just fill in um, for all those extra appointments that they may have. Uh, like in Florida, we have a real seasonality um, to our practices. And so relief vets really can help lift the burden and it feels good to help our, my colleagues, and it also feels good to be appreciated for it. Um, and I was just gonna talk briefly about sort of relief vet, I call them relief vet superpowers, but really they're just some extra skills that I think people need to have as relief vets beyond just the, the regular medical and, and surgical skills that are required of um, most veterinarians. But, um, you need to be really flexible. You've got to be flexible in your, um, in your practice style because not every clinic is the same. And those of you that have worked at multiple clinics probably realize this. Um, everyone does things a little bit differently. There's often not one right answer. And um, there's a lot of ways to, to treat different diseases. And I learned, that's the, I learned so much from practicing at all these different practices. I pick up different tricks and um, you know, sedation protocols and things like that. So learning how to be flexible and blend in to different environments, I think is a skill that will make you a happy um, relief vet. Um, being able to extract information from other people's medical records, also a really important skill. Um, sometimes, you know, medical records vary in their, um, in their style, in the amount of information that they actually give you, in their legibility, if it's a, you know, a practice that still uses paper records. Um, so you've got to become adept at, um, Sort of, I feel like a, sometimes a forensic scientist trying to just extract all the clues that I can find out of that record so that I can best help that um, patient and client that's presented to me. And I try really hard not to say, well, you know, it, it wasn't in the notes. You know, I just, you learn, you learn ways to extract information from the pet owner um, without uh, letting them know that you can't figure it out from the record. Um, that should be a skill in itself, don't you think? Yeah. That should be that right there. That applies no matter what career you're in. I think. Exactly. I think. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Um, and then it's important for us to keep meticulous records because we have to remember that um, the people that are coming after us may uh, that may actually be another relief vet. And so the more meticulous we can be with our records, um, the better. And um, I know that Warren is laughing right now because he has seen my handwriting <laughs> awesome. and he, and he came after me and so he had to read my record. So, um, don't always walk my talk with the handwriting, but I do try to get all the important information down. I love it. That's um, awesome. And then I do think it's really important to recognize that as a relief vet, um, the clinic is your client, not the pet owner and not the pet. Now you, you take good care of the pet owner and the pet because that's part of taking care of the clinic. And of course we care about them and that's part of our duty as a veterinarian. But I really feel that relief service is a business to business service and that the clinics are our client and our job is to support that clinic and to support the pet owner's bond to that clinic. Um, and there are lots of ways we can do that by being, um, well, personal and friendly to the, um, to the pet parent. And when you're speaking to the pet parent, using the veterinarians, the, the primary veterinarian's name, using the names of the, um, the staff, 
because it really helps them know that you are you are also a part of that team and that you know them and and they can then trust you more because they don't trust you at first they don't know you so they don't trust you so you learn little tricks for breaking down those barriers and so i think those are some of the skills that i've learned over time from practicing in so many different places and i've come to realize how important they are and how those are the things that can differentiate you as a relief vet and make you a really outstanding relief vet. So then if you're going to get into relief practice, um, I would say, well, well, like where do you even start? Like how do you even set up a relief practice? So one of the first things everyone has to think about is business setup. Um, and I'm just curious, I don't know the best way to, to extract answers about this, but, um, I'm curious for the relief vets that are there, how you've set up your business, meaning are you a sole proprietor? Are you an LLC? Are you an S Corp? Or how do you? Yeah, just shout it out. Go ahead and feel the shout it out. Unmute yourself. And... Um, I started doing full-time relief um, as of February 15th of this year, so I'm still very new at it. Congratulations. Um, thank you. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done it years ago. Um, <laughs> I came out of being a medical director from a corporate owned hospital, um, NVA, if you've heard of them, National Veterinary Associates. Yep. And I was scared to death. I talked to um, a couple of local specialists that we have that are mobile specialists. So they go around to all the area, different clinics doing um, cardiology and then internal medicine. So one's in mobile with his ultrasound and one's in mobile with his, his ultrasound for his echo. So anyway, I asked both of them because they've known me for years. And I was like, what do you think? And they said, Dawn, you're going to be great. You'll be fine. You're going to get booked out. Be careful. You'll work more than what you think you're working now. And I was like, okay, but what do I do like with money? Because I'm not a business sense pers person. So they actually, they said, you've got to get a bookkeeper. You've got to get a bookkeeper and you've got to get a CPA. And you've got to make sure you understand the guidelines of the 20, you guys are familiar perhaps with the, um, the 20 different questions the IRS will ask you if you really are truly a 1099 contractor or a W-2 employee, and you need to be very careful. So how did you set yours up, Dawn? Are you, are, are you an LLC? What are you? So what I did is I actually, um, I got the CPA's information that both of them use because they've been mobile for a couple of years and have been successful, not ended up, you know, in, in pokey by the IRS. So... Um, I called him and I just very, I gave him my, my idea and he was like, well, how about for right now you do um, a sole proprietor okay. and when we meet for your first quarterly tax assessment, because you should see you're making either too much money as a sole proprietor and we should turn you into an LLC or an S Corp. So I meet with him Friday because um, even though he said I could wait till June to pay taxes, I was like, no, no. I'll meet you in April. That's truly the first quarter. And right now my bookkeeper has set me up where she takes every single deposit that I either I put in or the few clinics that are paying me as a W-2 employee. W-2 employee, they take out the same taxes that always have been taken out for me because I'm single, not married, no kids, very easy tax person. Um, but everyone else who sends me a check I just put aside, I know that I get taxed personally right at 30%. Yeah, I do. I always have. So I take 30% out of every single um, check I deposit and I put it into a savings account. And that's just that's, sitting there. Away. That's awesome. What about anyone else? How have they set up their business? I just created um, an LLC and an S Corp recently um, per my CPA. Um, We'll see how it goes. I've been doing this for about three months. So. Oh, you're, you're <laughs> too. This is awesome. It's um, yes, guys. boggling my mind because um, they also, with that, she wants me to hire a payroll company and I'm kind of in the midst of trying to figure that out um, for, I guess, the LLC component of it. So tax-wise, she feels that that's going to benefit me um, in the end, maybe up to $3,000 of benefit you know, based on a hundred thousand dollar a year, um, gain. So we'll see. <laughs> I 
I haven't paid first quarter taxes yet. I still haven't hired the payroll company because I've had some hiccups with that. But, um, and also just trying to figure it out. Um, I'm finding that that's a little bit challenging for me too because my CPA charges $125 an hour. Um, and she's very serious about that. And I appreciate the, you know, the, the professional, you know, ability she has, but to answer a question, she'll bill me at point one of an hour, you know, over. <laughs> so I think your idea about a bookkeeper is probably a better idea than to ask these little questions to my CPA. Um, you know, at six dollars, a yes or no question. <laughs> um, but that's exactly what Cindy's going through. So this is great. We've got some great uh, understanding of a couple people with a sole proprietor and LLC. So I'll let you continue on this. I, I have to weigh oh. in. I have to weigh oh. in. Sorry, oh. Joy. <laughs> because here's the deal. I, I disagree with that viewpoint. I think you don't need a bookkeeper. You can keep your books by yourself on QuickBooks online yeah. really easily. But you do need a CPA. Unless you're me and you are a CPA. <laughs> so the rest of you all need CPAs. Uh, yeah. Are you a CPA? I am, yeah. So really important because this is EPM. I know they're billing, I mean, they might be billing you their time, but it's really valuable information. Um, for me, oh, I totally get that. Totally get that. <laughs> I've structured mine as an LLC, and I would, I think, in my mind, there's absolutely no reason to structure your business any other way. As a sole proprietor, you're opening yourself up to too much risk, and LLC gives you some legal protection because mm -hmm. um, it is considered a separate legal entity but an s corp has to file its own taxes so you're incurring too much tax and you know cpa fees mm -hmm. um, to do that so but for me i, I wouldn't go any other way than an llc um, without the s corp no s corp i do it llc i will add that a lot some states but not all of them require veterinarians to register as a professional limited liability company. Okay. So you can check with your state to see, you know, if that's a requirement in your state. In which so case it does take a little longer to set up your, your LLC. That's really good information, Joy. I mean, I, that's... Yeah. It's good we have the bonus CPA on here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I won't even bill you for boy. <laughs> something, something else that I was deductible. Something else, real quick, and Joy, you may be able to um, correct me if this is incorrect or not. But I was told by a veterinary management group that a lot of relief vets will actually charge mileage. And they said, you need to be careful because if you're truly a 1099 contractor, you cannot charge mileage. That is correct. If you get audited, you are getting yourself in trouble and you'll get that clinic in trouble that because it's- That is correct. You cannot okay. charge mileage, but that being said, you can deduct your mileage on your tax return. Yes. Good. You cannot you charge your clients for it. You don't track yeah. it. Don't I use uh, mile, uh, mile IQ. I believe yes, it. that's what I use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it oh, tracks all okay. my drives. And at the end of the year, I just do a printout of, hey, here's my business miles, here's my personal miles, and that's the end of that. Um, if you do travel, uh, you know, out of state and you, you know, doing out of town travel, you can deduct all of that as well. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it back over to Cindy because well, we got more to cover. We had a great conversation. But Cindy, <laughs> I I to Maybe we should do another one with both of us. I know. <laughs> oh, we should do it. Because I mean, truly, this is like this is great conversation because this is all the kind of stuff that's um, that can be tricky to figure out. Now, I have always operated as a sole proprietor the whole time, um, and. Re relief rover is an llc but that's that's different than how i've operated as a relief veterinarian um and i do think it sort of depends and i i understand what joy is saying about um because the, the reason you would do a limited liability company is um for protection purposes um and then and then as as gretchen pointed out uh, for like different CPAs will give people different advice about um, 
S Corp, LLC, your taxes and what, what makes sense. And, and Joy probably knows this better than me. And I would never give people advice that you, you should do it as an LLC or an S Corp or a sole proprietor because I don't know people's particular situation. And mm -hmm. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a CPA. Um, my goal with, with Relief Rover and talking to, to people about relief is to let them know what they need to think about and what they need to ask their professionals. So um, those are basically the three, the three ways you can run your relief business, sole proprietor, LLC, or an escort. So those are the things that you need to think about. Um, other things that I think are really important that I want to get to before we run out of time is insurance. <laughs> like insurance is such an, an important um, piece of setting up your business. And again, your insurance needs, everyone's insurance needs may be a little bit different, but the main insurance that you need to have, you need to have health insurance. You really should have disability insurance. Yeah. Um, the younger and healthier you are when you get that, the better. Um, you need liability, professional liability insurance, of course. Um, and I do think you need to think hard about the liability and, and coverage and, and perhaps talk to an insurance professional about it. Because in some ways, as a relief vet, you're at maybe a little bit um, greater risk because you don't know the clients. They don't know you. You may be a little bit more likely to... Um, you know, have misunderstandings with the clients. Um, you don't know the practices um, as well. You know, you, you don't um, control how frequently that anesthesia machine gets maintenance. You don't, you don't have any control over all of those kinds of things that can affect your liability. So that's just something to think about. Now, I will say in all of these years, um, I have, well, that's not true. I did have one problem, but it wasn't, um, I never even saw the animal. This is a weird story. It's too long to tell. But that's the only time I ever had to reach out to, to um, the PLIT. Um, so it's not that I want people to be freaked out by being a relief vet that, oh, it's so scary and your liability is so much higher. But I do think that there are unique risks to it. And it's just something to consider and talk to an insurance specialist about. Agreed. And another, another thing is workers' comp. It's like everyone's like, what's the freaking deal with workers' comp? I mean, I'm about to go insane as I have been, I've been like an investigative reporter trying to figure out this whole workers' comp thing. Some of it is hard to figure out because it depends state to state. Um, but the long and short of it is, is that um, for the most part, um, as a 1099, we are not required to carry workers' comp. That may be different in certain states, but as far as I know, here I know here in Florida, I'm not required to carry workers' comp because I have no employees. Workers' comp is an insurance that is set up for entities with employees. Practices, and this there are differing opinions on this. Practices, at least in Florida, do not have to pay if you get injured at a practice. Their workers' comp does not cover you, according to the state of Florida. However, insurance companies audit these practices every year and when they audit them they ask them for workers comp i'm sorry they ask them for 1099 pay and that affects their premium so what's happening is they're charging the practice for 1099s but they don't cover 1099s so there's something shady there um, there's a longer story to that, and I did talk to an insurance specialist out in California, and she has been in the insurance industry working with veterinarians exclusively for 32 years. She gave me the backstory on that, but it's too long to tell. But it's so, but the important thing to know is ask your health insurance if they will cover you for on the job injuries. Because what I, I never bothered to ask, I always just assumed my health insurance would cover me for on the job injuries. Well, I asked them and they say, no, we won't cover you for on the job injuries because workers comp should cover it. So there's a hole there. If my mm -hmm. health insurance won't cover it because they expect workers comp to cover it, but workers comp doesn't cover it because I'm a 1099. And you can get workers comp coverage as a 1099, but my understanding is there's only one insurance company that will do it and they don't like to do it because you don't have employees. So there's a hole in coverage there. I just did mine through the AVMA, my work runs comp. 
you're as a single person? Yes, yes so ma'am. They yes. might underwrite it through Hartford. They because do. my understanding is so Hartford is the yes. only yeah, insurance. It company. is through Hartford. And I was a I was told that Workman's Comp Insurance was gonna be outrageous for me and it was like right right around nine hundred dollars and I do a monthly payment and I'm happy to do it. And they also something I didn't think of is they told me I should get business liability insurance. It's like, I'm not a business. And they said, no, no, no. What you need to think about is that you're going to so many different clinics and most clinics, if you break a piece of equipment, they're going to say, Oh, our insurance will cover that. But what if you're at a clinic and they, they say, no, you broke it. You owe us that piece of equipment. And I break things a lot. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> so much. How, much, how much do I pay? <laughs> That's a good, that's, Don. that's, that is a good point. I had, because I, I thought about business um, insurance, but only in terms of it, it was ours, you know, like for, for equipment that I was carrying around. So say I, I right. travel an ultrasound or endoscopy, I have my own endoscopy, but that's, I never thought of it that way. Nor did I until the agent yeah. was like, Hey, you might want to consider this. And I was like, no, I don't, I have the stethoscope in myself. I'm fine. And he was like, no, no, no. If you break their ultrasound. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's already happened to me once, but the corporation paid for it. Wow, that's really good insight right there. That's really good. Yeah. That really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say even the Bridge Club has to carry insurance and all we're doing is seeing your beautiful faces. Exactly. <laughs> we're not gonna hurt anybody or break anything, I don't think. If you break a glass, it's your glass. It's I'm on just... your own, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, really. We will not cover any breakage. <laughs> that's awesome. But those yep. are so many things I didn't know. I just kept like asking, asking and digging because I was terrified about going out and doing this and not A, hurting an animal or B, hurting my license and my livelihood. So, so it's interesting because Cindy, I mean, there, there are an awful lot of positives to being a relief vet, clearly, right? With the freedom and all that kind of stuff. But as you said, the business side of things can get a little bit complicated. So it's not as easy as, as Don said, going out with your stethoscope and your DVM degree and here I am going to work. So it's really interesting conversation. And it's getting, it, it is getting a little trickier too with, um, in California, um, you know, with, they have a, they had a new um, law come down that, so re, actually it's really hard in California to practice as a 1099. In fact, if, I think my understanding is, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I did talk to some California lawyers. If you are practicing that really it's impossible to practice as a veterinarian, as a 1099 in California. Mm. I think people are still doing it. And what he explained to me is that it just, cause it hasn't trickled through. And I don't know, Joy, do you practice in California at all? I don't, but I have seen the chit chat that's been going on about it and, and you exactly right. They essentially made it impossible um, for veterinarians to practice as 1099s. And I think it's probably going to, expand to a lot of states so a lot of you will probably have noticed that most of the corporations have gone to w-2s and this is the reason why they kind of want to just avoid the, the headache of having to deal with 1099 which is which is problematic for us and and joy you can correct me if i'm wrong because as a w-2 it inhibits our ability to write certain things off and is that correct like from a tax perspective it it right. inhibits us, yeah. Um, the benefits that we would get from correct. being a 1099. That is correct. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So, but but then you gain you gain no benefits of being an employee. Yeah. You get no benefits of being an employee, but you get your benefits of being um, your own business. You get that taken away. So I I I mean, and I don't think California surely wasn't even thinking about veterinarians. I don't, you know, um, I think it had to do with uh, employers who were basically hiring people as 1099, then they probably would have rather been employees, but they were, they were sort of, so they were sort of more abusive. Is that right? That's exactly yeah. right. So it was, yeah. employers were saying, we're not going to withhold tax. We're not going to employ I pay employers tax for you guys. We're just going to 1099 you. And um, yeah, so that's why they closed that loophole, but it ha obviously has some consequences. For so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here because we are, uh, we're at 30 minutes and we always promise we'll be prompt, but this is where it gets fun. So this is now the after party. See, we do things a little differently at the Bridge Club. 
So we've now done the main part. Now comes the after party part. And this is more. And we kind of jumped into a little after party a little bit earlier on here. We, so. did, we did a little smidge. All right. Um, yeah. But I, I, I will say that. So for those of you who need to leave, that's fantastic. I mean, we appreciate you coming. And, well, it's not fantastic. But it's we not fantastic, but <laughs> we get it. Um, and I will say, for those of you who are new to the Bridge Club, I will say this is that coming and joining any of our conversations is absolutely 100% free. You can log in at any time to do it. However, if you miss the conversation or want to be able to um, join a different conversation, we do have an annual membership and, and everyone hold on to your seats. It's really expensive. It is $20 and 19 cents. And you well, have- the business can deduct it. <laughs> yeah, and you can deduct it from your business. Uh, and it gives you access to all of our um, videos that we have, as well as special events that we have. In fact, we're going to be hosting one coming up here that is telling us what should we else should we be talking about. So uh, that's my only sales pitch on the Bridge Club, but only $20.19. But I do actually have a question because uh, I was in New York City yesterday and having our, the day before and having dinner. And we were talking about relief vets that this conversation was coming up. And one of the veterinarians as a practice owner um, said, you know, can we talk about um, malpractice insurance? She said, because I'd like to really understand there are uh, relief vets who don't have it. And she said, and I cannot have a relief vet that comes into practice without malpractice insurance. So where does that stand for everybody? What is the recommendation? Is it by practice? Is it not standard? What, where does that stand? Well, for us, I mean, that's, that's a really liability our liability insurance yeah. um, and so I think probably every veterinarian out there has liability insurance she says they come in all the time don't have it she says it's so common and she has to say they can't they can't be there she goes it's so yeah. beyond common because I think I'm gonna pay it for them isn't that, that, isn't that interesting uh, any place I've, been, that I've gone sorry you go ahead any place I've gone to I've only been at nine different practices um, since I started this, but prior, they all asked me for copies of my DEA, right. my state license, and my CLIT. That's they asked me straight up. Like before so I even why is she getting people that are not? I this is in Dallas, know. Texas. You think this um, would be. Yeah. Plus, I, I think those veterinarians are putting themselves at significant risk. Oh, beyond. It is absolutely correct. I have a friend who's on the this Arizona State Vet Board, and she's the vast majority of cases brought to the board are relief vets for all the reasons that you mentioned. Wow. Oh my so, gosh. You know, I think you're just putting yourself at risk. And you one of the one of the reasons that I started Relief Rover, and I certainly I do not claim to have all the answers. I am learning so much as I as I go along, but was because I want I I really believe that relief practice is an important business to business service within our profession. It's a really important niche. And the thing that, and it's been, I mean, people have been being relief vets for a long time. So it's not like some, it's not a new thing, but what, what I wasn't seeing, I wasn't seeing the respect in our profession of, of relief vets as, um, as having these unique skill sets and this, and this, and providing this important service. And that's a disappointing um, thing to hear, but I'm also, I guess, in some ways not surprised. And I really want to provide people who want to be relief vets or people who already are relief vets with the information that they need to make these important um, decisions about how to set up their business, how to protect themselves, how to provide good service to a clinic so that we can overall elevate um, this niche within the profession so that it's a respected niche and that and that people with this true business to business um, service mindset will rise to the top and they will be the ones that are providing services to these clinics and that that you know relief vets that um, and, and and you know and this isn't this isn't just relief vets I mean we probably all many of us if you've been to enough clinics you've been to clinics where hmm maybe it's a little sketchy like that, that people aren't always um, practicing at a level that's consistent with what we would, would like. And, and um, but relief vets 
also fall into that category. So that's what I'm trying to do. And so hopefully we will, as we get out there and we're practicing and we're having conversations like this and we're figuring out the right way to do things, at least is the best, the best we can, that we will elevate this niche. That's, I think it's a, that's a worthy um, cause, Cindy, and it's really interesting. We're living in an increasingly entrepreneurial age, right? Where people are choosing not to go to work for somebody else. They're choosing to want to work for themselves. So sharing your experience, you know, your journey thus far, and then having people, you know, weigh in with their own personal experiences is really very helpful to mm -hmm. people who are either thinking about it or doing it and want to compare notes with other people. So we were really excited to bring this conversation to the table because Catherine and I believe too that it's a really important part of this changing profession. So, you know, I just want to take the opportunity on behalf of the Bridge Club to say thank you for sharing what you're experiencing. This is really an important part of the kind of conversations we want to have. And thanks to everybody too who's pitching in to, to share their thoughts. It's, it's, a, it's a cool conversation. It really, really is. And I will challenge all of you who have not turned on your cameras to just try it for a minute or two. <laughs> and none of us, none of us have died as a result of having our cameras on. Yeah. And, and clearly for some of us, it's been a long day. Long day. Yeah. Long day. Long day. Got bright Amen. lights on my face right now. Amen, sister. So. Kind of crazy. Any other kind of questions, comments, et cetera? Because we always want to, oh, 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 joy. I'm full of questions. So we spoke a lot about health, ins about insurance. What does everyone do for health insurance? Because to me, that's the only benefit of being an associate over being a really fit. Good question. Well, not the only, but a big one. Wait, so what, are, what about health insurance? What do you guys do about health insurance? What do you do for health insurance? Oh, I pay a ludicrous amount of money um, <laughs> for very little benefit. How that's you what I do. That is necessarily, <laughs> that's all I've been able to figure out. She's honest. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I found that apparently I'm relatively healthy for a 43 year old. Go figure. Um, Cause I'm not, on any any meds i'm multivitamins that's it um and nothing crazy crazy and i found coverage that is equal to my corporation's coverage and i'm paying about 90 extra dollars a month for it wow. so for me it was very it wasn't that bad for me i guess but I'm, again i'm, I'm very lucky because i'm single and no kids and hamana hamana where did you find it it's um freedom Freedom Medical, Freedom, and I can actually, I mean, if anyone's interested, if, if uh, uh, Brenda or yeah, uh, I don't, yeah. Cindy can direct me, I'm happy to, um, to forward so you the- Throw it in the chat if you I'm can. I'm just going to say, yeah, chat, the chat or else. I can, yeah, his name is, he's the insurance provider, or he's the insurance um, agent, and he showed me proof of his license, because that's the other thing. If you go online, you Google you'll get some really wonky options and this point, <laughs> they can't even legally offer you insurance. So his name's Josh and I'll, I'm happy to share his, his contact. He'd love it. Cause I'm sure he's making a profit off oh, of yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah, you just put it in the chat or else you can send it to Catherine at the bridge club.com or Brenda at the bridge club.com and we'll share it out. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy to do it. He's been very straightforward, very straight up. He um, showed me lots of different, not just options, but also um, samples of like invoices of, people that he's in, got insurance coverage through and like what they paid and what they had to pay out of pocket and what it covered. So, and I, sure enough, as soon as I ended up working relief at a random clinic, they gave me bronchitis. <laughs> so Donna, what market are you in? Where are you? I'm in Virginia beach. Okay. Good to know. So I went just because I don't have a primary care provider because I only go to my, my OBGYN routinely because I'm that chick. Um, but I, yeah, but I was just going to say is, is, uh, uh, he's gone, but how many of all, all of us have done that? <laughs> <laughs> like I just, OB GYN, primary yeah. care. Okay. Yeah, I go to my eye doctor and I go to my OBGYN, but if I'm <laughs> sick, I just go to like the local little urgent care and what I paid, um, after my insurance covered everything, what I paid was usually I pay 50 bucks through my corporate insurance. I, I got a bill for 117. I'm good with that. Like I'm okay. <laughs> hey. What about everyone else? 
I just started this year and I, I haven't started working yet relief, but I got short-term health insurance. Thanks to Donald Trump, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is really cheap, but it doesn't have good coverage. So next year, I, I don't know what I'll do. I'm sure it'll be more expensive. So yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry I didn't, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm a little bit of a mess because I have had major illnesses and no health insurance companies do not like me. And so I just, I have to pay what I have to pay. And, um, and I just do um, high deductible. It's really, really for catastrophic. And it makes me angry every time I have to pay because I know I'm paying for nothing unless something catastrophic happens and then <laughs> and then hopefully it'll pay for itself but no I, I think that that's tricky because that is another part of you know working for yourself and you don't I mean that's a downside to being a relief vet and you have to work that into your to your budget um I did make this little I think anyway it's a nifty tool <laughs> and it's on relief rover for those of you who have seen it's reliefrover.com I have a, I made a wage calculator and basically what you can do is you put in your business expenses and you put in your personal expenses and there's like prompts for all of it. And then there's miscellaneous in case you have some expenses that I didn't think of. Then you put in um, how many days out of the year you would like to work. So you can sort of think, all right, this is how much money my life costs. This is how many days out of the year I'd like to work. And then it calculates what you would need to make per day, um, per shift in order to support that lifestyle. That's really smart. Um, and so then you can see if this is realistic or not. So maybe you're like, oh, I only want to work, you know, 20 days a week, but I have a, you know, half a million dollar budget, you know, you're, it's, nobody's going to pay you that. But, um, so it, it allows you to tinker with it to see if relief practice is even practical for your particular circumstances. Cause everyone has different circumstances. Right. That's so smart, Cindy, because you said at the start that one of the reasons you liked doing this is because you wanted to be able to like work really hard and then take some time off and then work mm -hmm. really hard and take some time off. So having that calculator really helps you gauge the trade-off, right? And for you, it's higher cost health insurance, obviously, than if you mm -hmm. were employed by somebody, but the freedom you gain, I'm guessing you feel is worth it. Yeah, right. For, for me, it is. And, you know... It's um, totally worth it. Yeah. <laughs> All, my, um, my significant other, he basically, he was, he told me to do this years ago, but he basically took, he's really good with numbers and I'm not, and it kind of pisses me off to be somewhat smarter with me, but um, he basically took my annual income like the last five years and he was like, this is what you make annually because it was a pro sal. So there was a little, you know, variation. But he was like, all you have to do is book 11 and a half days a month to equal out what you currently make after taxes. And that made it for me. I was like, oh, that's totally 11 and a half days in a month. I can easily do that. And instead, you know, I'm working five and a half, six days, <laughs> sometimes seven <laughs> right now. But it was, I chose to do it. And that made it less daunting for me that yeah. some he had to break it down for me like that. But I was like, this is doable. I can totally do this. I can book 11 and a half days, easy breezy, and I can still live a, our comfortable lifestyle. So that's another way if someone can do a breakdown like that for you, it just makes it less daunting to be like, oh, I can, I can do relief. No, no worries. That's good. Here's another question that I always struggle with is the whole DEA license thing because I do not have one currently and I'm debating whether or not I should get one as a relief vet. And because it's a boatload of money and is it really essential? Did you say DEA? I couldn't hear what you Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I don't have one either and I'm scared about the price. <laughs> yeah. How much is it? How much is it? It was like, like seven, uh, 790 or something. Yeah, it's like 771. But that's, so how often do you have to pay that? Three every years, three years, every three years. Mm -hmm. so, okay, so it, um, I have always had my own um, and I don't know that it's, I mean, obviously, you know, Joy, you've been practicing without it. I, it, it allows me to write scripts for people. Really, that's all it, 
that's the only difference. Well, I, I don't carry any of my own drugs around, so I don't have to keep a log. I don't have to do any of that. Right. Um, I had actually practices almost never asked me for a copy of my DEA. Um, really? I just, mm -mm, nope. I just, boss, I just say I don't have one. No, right. No. You don't yeah. have to have one, I don't think. You and don't. the only thing that that means is that, that I think technically you're not supposed to write scripts. Oh, you're not allowed to write scripts for controlled drugs. Right. I mean, that's what I mean. Correct. For controlled Correct. drugs. Correct. So for if controlled I'm drugs. going to dispense Tramadol, I'll dispense it out of the clinic. And right. if the client doesn't Correct. want it out of the clinic, I'll give them a write a script for Gabapet. You know, I just think there's lots of ways to get around it. But you I can I get around it. It ends up being... It ends up being that anything that you do when you're in the hospital, though, if you don't have a DEA license, the VIC, the veterinarian in charge, it falls under their license when mm -hmm. you're in hospital. Um, so my only thing is, it having been the VIC, it made me nervous that everyone in the hospital, it was all under my DEA license. Mm -hmm. So if anything went wonky, That's DEA really came point. calling on me. Yeah, yeah. So the only, I guess the only thing would be like, say a Saturday you work at as a sole <coughs> practitioner, it's a one doc on and it's you and the Vic isn't there and something weird goes wrong with the drug cabinet. I don't, that makes me nervous. Uh, so I just, I carry my own DA license. I'm like $771. It wasn't fun, but you know what? It's me. It's on me. And I do nothing with controlled substances unless there's multiple witnesses and cameras. <laughs> so. I just, I'm real paranoid about litigation. Rightly so in this day and age, and rightly so. Exactly. Well, I, I have the dilemma of, you know, am I leaving myself exposed by not having it? I, I don't, I don't think you're, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, do you, do you have, um, do you have an attorney that, like I have one of my old clients that was an attorney and they actually do stuff for medical, like human doctors. Mm -hmm. So I just, I text her. Well, text her and ask her for me. I don't <laughs> have to. <laughs> so, you text I her? A, She's really nice. We're, I have a call out to, um, and I'm waiting to hear back from, there's a group that um, Peter Weinstein knows them. He's a, he's a, a veterinarian that is um, a part of Vet Partners. He, because there's so many DEA questions that I am not sure of the answer to, and just try. I've tried a bazillion times to call the DEA. I've talked to them at conferences, been promised, you know, callbacks. Like none. Of, it's it's really horrible to try to get in touch with them and get these questions answered. Mm -hmm. But there's a group that they um, they used to work for the DEA, and they're in California. And he put me in touch with them, and I have a. Um, an email to them. I haven't heard back from them yet, but I think because of the Peter Weinstein connection, I will hear from them. So I'm going to ask that question because, um, because that is some information I want to, to provide. And I'm trying so hard to provide the information <laughs> accurately. And I am telling you, it's really hard to do that because you get a different opinion from everyone you ask about all this kind of stuff. But um, I'll ask that question, Joy. I'll let you know what I find out. So to that point, guys, I mean, we're getting on, we're getting on, um, you know, 49 minutes into the deal and we've had, this is a really phenomenal conversation. So I, maybe we check and see if anybody who hasn't had a chance to speak up yet has a question for Cindy or Carrie or Lisa or I'm going to call you all out. We got Cheryl and a beautiful cat over there. That is a large cat though. I am thinking that <laughs> is, how big is that cat? You got to unmute yourself. You got to tell us how big that cat is. I want to know. He's about, he's 14 pounds. That's a big cat. Big cat. He's a big boy. This is just the size spread. of your dog, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just looking at it. I'm looking at him on her and I'm like, that's a big cat. That's, that, that cat's head is bigger than her hand. Um, and Angela, thank you for turning on your camera. I noticed, paid attention. Um, so a couple things before we let do the parting shots and let anyone uh, ask any final questions. Yes, get an accountant. Yes, have an attorney. Yes, get QuickBooks. And the only one that I would add on to it as an entrepreneur as well, uh, yes, look into payroll. Um, it is expensive to do, but if you run enough, if you uh, can actually equal out the cost, I do not pay quarterly taxes. I'm to monthly because I can't stand the stress 
and pressure of having to stash cash for taxes. So um, it's just too much stress for me and I can run payroll like that. Um, so I will tell you it was the best investment I think I've made in my five years of being uh, an independent. So that's all. Do you have a recommendation for the payroll company? I'm using paychecks right now, but I think I might switch. I just found out uh, there is some, there's some challenges in, in the way uh, paychecks is, is causing me some, a little bit of headache. So someone has just given me a new reference. I'm going to look into it, but my accountant loves paychecks and they gave me a discount because of it. So um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. It was, it was really a pain to get on. Um, but now that I'm on it, I'm like, woo, paycheck. Paying taxes. <laughs> uh, so with that, any other questions quickly for Cindy? And then we will do one last uh, parting shot in our final toast. I guess I have a quick, just general question. Um, I'm still in general practice. I'm about to give my notice so that I can start relief work. Um, what, would, what would you take with you when you start relief work? Just like you and your stethoscope or books? Or do you take special equipment or... Great. You know, what do you carry with you? That's a good question. I, I take my stethoscope um, and my indirect ophthalmoscope because I like it and a lot of practices don't have that. Um, but that's it. I have, I have my Plums app on my phone, which I would die without that. Um, so I love my Plums app. Um, and then everything else, I just use what's there. Now, I've talked to a lot of um, relief vets who, they bring a whole lot of other stuff that they like. Um, they bring like loops or um, maybe if they're doing dentistries, I've, I've heard of some that bring some special um, like gingival elevators, things like that, that sometimes practice don't have and not sharp or, or whatever. But I, that is all I bring. I just kind of deal with whatever, whatever I, I got. And I don't mind doing that. I used to carry my books around with me in the back of the car. I had them in a big box, but now I bring my computer. That's the other thing I bring so that I can always look things up online. So, you know, I have a VIN membership. I look, you know, I, I use that if I need it. Um, I look things up online. So I don't really carry very much, but you get a different, you'll, you'll figure out what's comfortable for you. Yeah. I, I do uh, very sim similar to Cindy. I do use, a couple apps like I've got Vin. I I like the Good RX Pharmacy app because a lot of owners don't know about it. And if you have to MacGyver something with cost, you can do it for them real quick. And they're like, "Oh my gosh, thank you so much!" And you're like, "Yeah, you just got to download." And so that's helpful, I think, for them. But Vin is your friend. Plums is always your friend. The Plums app. And I've got um, a folder in my my whatever doc bag. It's like a doc bag purse. But it's just got some copies of like some basic charts that I, I just know I need to reference if something wonky happens. So I have yeah. it with me. Just and um, you should bring, always bring a copy of your license because okay. I, yes. I, they need to display that. Uh, hmm. Bring a copy of your license for them. Um, yeah. Any other? I, and good luck, Lisa. That's yeah. Thank you. You're, right. you're well, going to love it. You it's might so be our party uh, toast to be able to say, you know, good luck on your newest venture. Good for you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. And I, Cindy, I mean, this has been really great. I think we could have probably gone for like an hour and a half and everything, but so, I mean, some, some is there anything, Cindy, that you wanted to share with the group that you haven't yet had the opportunity to share? Well, I just want to say there's, there, there's more and more resources coming out for relief vets and we're working really hard. So relief forever is working really hard to provide things. Um, there's, uh, uh, Joyful DVM is working hard right now. Hi, Carrie. Um, she's working on a class uh, called Relief Vet 101. Um, she had uh, a class before she's revamping it. It's got some really good information. It kind of helps go through in modules and answer all these questions. Um, and, and I think it's going to be really helpful for people to kind of get some kind of formula for setting that up. Um, I have some blog resources on, on Relief Rover. Um, I also helped, I didn't write this book, but I helped edit a book called Flex Vet, How to Be One, How to Hire One. Um, that was written by Karen Smith. She's a veterinarian who, she wrote this book, I think for the first time in the 90s, and it's on its fifth edition and its third Kindle edition. It's only a Kindle book right now. But it also, it talks about being a part-time vet. It speaks to 
relief part-time, and then also speaks to the practices that are hiring these types of vets. Um, so that's another resource that's available on Amazon. Um, I'm listed on there as an author. Um, it's only because I, I edited it, it for her. I didn't write that book. She take, it should get all the credit for that. Um, so anyway, so there's a lot of resources and, um, and I am always, please reach out to me. You can, you can reach out to me through Relief Rover. I am happy to answer questions. I don't know everything, but I'm really working hard to find it out. Um, and I will, I'll make phone calls, emails, and, and knock down doors to find out answers for us so we can try to do things um, correctly and really enjoy our career. So I'm really thankful that all of you guys came. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm thankful that I got to meet you at that partners, that this is what it turned into. This is fantastic. So uh, can everyone raise your glass? Uh, and I'd like to do a final toast to all the relief vets, the future relief vets, the current relief vets. Thank you for your service. And uh, we hope that uh, this has been helpful. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone have a great evening. I hope to see you again on another Bridge Club, guys. We really, really enjoyed having all these fresh faces in the mix. Very Thank nice. You. Thank you. Awesome, guys.